This conference will now be recorded. All right, guys. So sorry about the delay in that. Um, I wasn't able to talk to you, which doesn't help. Um, so uh, we're here with the um, RTD Accountability um, Governance Subcommittee. One thing I do want to ask, I know that we have a variety of folks on the phone or on this call. I'm seeing lots of different names. Um, if you want to feel free to um, write your name into the chat with um, whichever organization you're representing, just so that we all get a sense of who's on this call um, as we as we move forward. Um, I think that could be really helpful. Um, we do have the meeting minutes um, from October 9th. Doug, do those need to be approved by the subcommittee? Okay, all right. If there's any changes that anybody has to these minutes, please just let um, Doug know so that we can um, get those reflected. Um, and really, I want to move us quickly on to our uh, presentation. We have LA, LA Metro here, um, and we're going to be really focusing on um, looking at those uh, local service councils, but also just hearing from them in general. I know that folks probably have lots of questions, so feel free um, to throw your questions into the chat. Um, and if we don't get an answer during the presentation, then we'll make sure to follow up with them. Also, feel free to use your uh, your hand um, to raise a hand if you have a question. Um, and then other than that, I think let's get started here. Um, so thank you so much um, for joining us and, and we're, we're excited to hear what's passed. Great. Great, thank you. I guess I'll get started. Um, thanks, Doug, for inviting myself and Dolores Ramos. I'm Conan Chung. I'm Senior Executive Officer over Service Development at LA Metro. Um, what's within my group are bus and rail uh, service planning, scheduling, data analytics, and our regional service councils. And who I have on the phone as well today is Dolores Ramos, and she really manages the entire service council uh, a process and, and um, uh, membership and administrating and, and sort of doing the entire, uh, you know, sort of nine yards. And she's been with service councils for quite a while, so she's got a rich history uh, with them. So I'm going to go over a couple quick slides just to give you a little bit of history on the service councils, and then I'm going to turn over to Dolores to get into more of the details. Next slide, Dolores. Great, now I've frozen. Hmm. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, there we go, okay. <laughs> oh, great, okay. So hopefully you see this, it's a back, background slide. Basically, um, back in 2003, sort of the early 2000s, we had um, a lot of different areas within the LA Metro sort of jurisdiction that felt like, you know, they wanted their fair share of service, right? I mean, LA is a, a very large region, it's very diverse. Um, in fact, before 2003, we had a portion of our service area in San Gabriel Valley sort of carved off. And with that, you know, went the budgets and the assets and all that. And it went to what we know now as Foothill Transit, which is a separate, you know, transit authority uh, for the uh, San Gabriel Valley. Now, the San Fernando Valley, uh, which is somewhat sort of separated from the L.A. Basin, you know, uh, with the mountain range, um, they started feeling that they weren't, you know, sort of uh, taken care of as well as they should be. And so they started talking about wanting to sort of secede from, you know, LA Metro as well. And that's when, um, at that time, John Cato and Roger Snowball, uh, the CEO and, and COO, decided, okay, why don't we create these service sectors? And the service sectors were basically somewhat uh, semi-autonomous areas. We have one for the San Fernando Valley. We had a San Gabriel Valley service sector, a West Side Central, a South Bay, and then a Gateway Cities uh, service sector. So there were the region was sort of divided into five different uh, subregions, and each one had its own general manager. It had uh, probably two operating divisions each for bus. Uh, it had its own sort of scheduling, uh, data analytics, uh, planning function within each of them, and it had its own um, service council, which was basically their sub-regional board. Now, the, the board of directors at Metro is still, you know, sort of uh, controlled or had uh, governance over the entire service from all five service sectors. But the day-to-day -day operations, the service changes, 
uh, things like that that, that really affect people um, you know in terms of service levels and, and service changes those were the responsibilities of each of the service sectors and as at LA Metro uh, when I first joined we still had the service sectors so my job was really more to coordinate the five different service sectors and to make sure that their budgets were aligned with our overall agency operating budget and I would set policies for them to follow but again the day-to-day -day actions were, were uh, under them. So you can see there it's really to try to bring operations close to the customers and, and communities that they serve. Um, again each one was sort of, sort of semi-autonomous. It was you know they all had their individual service area uh, service hours so, um, you know, they really ran their own show in, the, in that sense. And, um, you know, we would try to coordinate at the high level to make sure that we weren't being, uh, we were fairly consistent in terms of how we did things. Um, the service sectors had their service councils as an oversight body uh, to coalition formed on each service sector to conduct all the stakeholder meetings. Um, and we'll go into the details about the membership and really their bylaws and so forth. Next slide. So back in 2009, 2010, um, you know, we started seeing uh, sort of uh, uh, signs of the recession. And um, at the same time, we had a new general manager, our CEO, Art Leahy. Uh, he was a longtime LA Metro uh, person. He started as a bus operator and moved his way all the way up. And so he came back and he said, well, you know, this is inefficient. And so let's bring cent re-centralize the functions of the service sectors. But he wanted to keep the governance councils out there because again, it was a way for people to connect to Metro more easily and more familiarly versus having to come to downtown Los Angeles, come to a big, you know, uh, 25 story building, you know, very institutional and so forth. You know, these service sectors and service councils were very, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's easy to access them, you know, and, and they had, people were coming from their communities, so they understood the same issues. So we took the general managers back, we brought in um, the, the planning and scheduling, uh, uh, brought those all together and centralized those. Um, but again, we maintain the governance councils out there. And so today we continue to meet as regional service councils. Uh, they're overseen by a service council administrator and that's Dolores. Uh, each council is staffed by a service planning manager and also a community relations representative so that we make sure that uh, they have their technical expertise as well as the communications expertise to help support Dolores in, in terms of uh, managing each of the councils. And then uh, we continue to function to bring Metro closer to communities served, um, you know, by sort of pushing our outreach and, and our governance uh, through the region versus centralizing it all into uh, one body at the board. So next slide. Dolores, why don't you take it from here? Okay, thanks Conan. So as Conan mentioned, back in 2003, when the Governance Council's concept was created, the board went to the stakeholders of each region and asked them to come up with the structure for nominating their own region's representatives. So these are the five regions that he mentioned. Um, these are still existence today, and the nominating authorities that they each decide on, decided on are also still in effect today. Uh, a couple of things to note here, you'll see that there is COG representation uh, on each of the councils. Some of them, it's entirely COG, others it's uh, one seat or two seats. Um, four of LA County's uh, five Board of Supervisors, County Board of Supervisors, also have some appointments on these boards or on these councils, uh, as does the mayor. He, the mayor of Los Angeles has uh, seats or uh, appointments to make on two of the councils. And then uh, we also have in some of the regions what we refer to as city clusters. So for those seats, all of the cities in a particular cluster must agree and put forth one nominee for the appointment. So for example, the second uh, line in the group, uh, San Fern or I'm sorry, the first line in San Fernando Valley, the cities of Burbank, Glendale, and San Fernando have two seats. So whenever those seats come up, the three cities have to agree on the nominee for each of those seats. So in any one year, either two cities or maybe even only one city might be represented, depending who puts forth uh, nominees. 
In terms of the membership themselves, each council has nine members and they all serve three-year terms. Every year, uh, the terms of three members expire. So this helps provide a little bit of stability because we don't want to have a whole crop of nine new members every single year and have to try to educate them about the system and, and all the things that they'll need to do to do their jobs effectively. So, and it helps retain a little bit of institutional memory. Um, the members must live, represent, or work in the communities within the boundaries of their regions, and they should be using public transit within the region they represent. They, uh, as defined in their bylaws, they may be elected officials or private citizens. Uh, and again, uh, at least 50% of, of them should be regular users of public transit service. Regarding elected officials, some of the councils consistently have sit local city council members on their uh, regions or they as a, at their appointees, or they'll also have their city commissioners, for example, from their environmental uh, commissions or planning commissions, and they'll appoint them to, or they'll nominate them to the service council. And how the nomination process works, every year I send letters to the nominating authorities and that have seats whose three-year terms are going to come up for, for renewal. They send me letter of nominations and I package them to the Metro Board for approval. So with five councils, that's 15 seats per year that uh, expire, and but most of them tend to be incumbents that tend to get reappointed. Uh, the members do receive a $100 stipend for up to two meetings per month. The councils generally meet once per month, but they do occasionally have briefings or uh, their quarterly meeting with the CEO, which they would also receive a stipend for. And we do want to encourage them to use transit, the transit system regularly, so they also receive a Metro ID badge that serves as fair media on all Metro Rail and bus. The bylaws... Uh, establish the council's purpose and responsibilities. Essentially, as Conan was saying, they, re they should provide access to the public to be able to voice their concerns about Metro service and programs. Um, prior to COVID, we were meeting in each of the regions. We had established locations uh, and we have established dates, uh, you know, the first Wednesday of the month or the second Wednesday of the month and members of the public would attend and share their concerns. And we'd actually, the council members and staff would develop relationships with those members of the public who would come to our meetings regularly. Um, we do bring presentations to the councils on all aspects of Metro, uh, where there are products, projects and programs that require community engagement, they come to the councils to, to help uh, gather that uh, public, public comments. So for example, every year they get presentations on the proposed budget, and then we also do annual customer surveys, so they usually get a, a presentation on that, on, on the specifics for, for their region. And then we also have a station evaluation program that receive quarterly updates on. Um, they also receive monthly presentations on service performance, all of our KPIs on ridership, complaints, accidents, on-time performance, as well as any other informational items that are relevant to their region. Their, primarily, their primary responsibility is to call and conduct the private hearings for all major bus service changes. And I'll go into that a little bit more on the next slide. Uh, they also meet with the CEO and other executive staff on a quarterly basis. It gives them a chance to interact with the CEO and with each other because they generally meet separately from each other. Um, and generally for those meetings, we have a top, you know, they spend some time in a Q&A uh, with the CEO and then we have a topic that's, that's of relevance to the entire, uh, to all five regions. They also uh, preview and review our service changes. And sometimes when our uh, municipal operators are going through their own system redesigns or, or proposing major service changes, they'll approach the council to get their feedback. So they make suggestions for service improvement for other operators in the region as well. And then last but not least, uh, they submit annual evaluations of the council director, or now in this case, uh, the administrator. Uh, it's a simple evaluation, what they think is being done well, where they would like to see improvement. And those evaluations are shared with Conan and they can be used in the council staff uh, performance evaluations. Uh, their primary responsibilities, as I mentioned on the previous slide, the service councils conduct the, the public hearings and vote on all major bus service changes proposed within their regions. And major service changes are defined with as 25% of route miles or revenue service hours over a floating three-year period. They have the authority to approve, modify, or deny service proposals. 
we recently went through our system redesign and the five councils deliberated for a total of approximately 15 hours over the 111 proposals and um, I think Conan would agree with me that the proposals came out much better for the process. They they did make some modifications and, and we think we have a really good plan that we're looking forward to implementing. Uh, I would like to note that some of the lines do cross regions. We've got five regions, LA is a huge place and we don't schedule service by a region. So uh, in that case, we have what we call first and second authority over any particular line. Each of the lines in our system are assigned to a service council region. But when it comes to voting time, um, so uh, the first authority is the region that has the majority of the route. The second is the, the region that has the uh, second largest portion of that route. Then when they vote, if they disagree, the first authority's decision is the one that is carried forward to the board and then staff would try to mitigate any concerns uh, of the dissenting second authority. But for the most part, we found that they tend to agree. Uh, the service councils are also utilized as one of Metro's primary community outreach venues. If a program or, program or project needs to get community input before it can go to the board for a vote, the chances are it's been shared with our service councils first. And that function is listed within our triennial public participation plan. And wow, that's everything. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and we'll be happy to take any questions. I know it's a really quick overview. It <laughs> was a quick overview, but I'm, I'm really, uh, first of all, just really thankful to have you guys here. Um, and willing to present um, this opportunity to us. Um, so I'm getting a little bit of feedback. So that's okay, let's move forward. Um, so what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna um, open the floor to our committee members to ask questions um, to you guys. I know I got a couple of questions, but I'm gonna throw, throw it out to my other committee members right now. Um, anybody have a question for the group? Go ahead, Elise. Thanks so much for that presentation, for spending some time with us today. It's super helpful. I'm curious, how do you decide how much investment transit services goes in of your sub regions? Are they, do you decide ahead of time and then they have sort of control over what routes happen in that area? How does that happen? Dolores, do you want to take that one or you want me to start? You go ahead and take that one. <laughs> I, I think I think it's sort of a relic of, of the past in terms of when we had the service sectors. Um, you know, we hadn't changed our system, you know, in its entirety probably for, for 25 years or so. And so, um, you know, up until recently, you know, with our next gen project, we haven't really thought about wiping all the lines off the map and starting over. And so whatever the, the sectors or the sub areas had at the time of the service sectors, they maintain sort of control of those uh, as we got into the regional service council model where we centralized the planning and scheduling and whatnot, but you know, we maintained local governance out there. And so um, we may have changed some first authorities and, and stuff, Dolores, on some of the lines, but overall, each service area sort of maintained its own, you know, routes and 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 schedules and revenue hours and 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 so forth. So we we sort of stuck to that, even with, um, I mean, next gen it was slightly different because we really wanted to restructure the entire system and you know as as a whole versus doing mini plans. Because you may get you get you may get stuck into something like that, like you know when you look at New York City, um, you know with the boroughs, they're actually going through a system restructure, but they're doing it borough by borough, which is synonymous to our sort of service sector by service sector, I guess. Um, but we wanted to look at it holistically. So, for example, I think we we've, we've cut more service in the San Gabriel Valley uh, area, but we've added more in the San Fernando Valley area and the West Side area, just because of the ridership demand and the potential for, for more, uh, you know, more opportunities with, with growing the ridership. Thank you. 
Thanks. Well, just to follow up then, just as far as the budgeting goes, how do you determine, so if you're cutting in one area and increasing service in another area, obviously that creates some, regionally it might make sense, but at the local level, some feelings that pass and have not. How do you, is, there, is it a survivorship based, capital based, what system, uh, a performance based system? Yeah, I mean at Metro, we're we're actually a multimodal agency. Um, we we have you know basically four sales tax measures, Prop A and C and Measure R and M. And when you add it all together, it's two percent sales tax, which pre-COVID was about three billion dollars a year. And a lot of that money, especially with uh, Prop A and C and Measure R and M, um, you had a certain amount that went out for what we call local return. So 25% of the money from Measure r &M goes back to the cities, the 88 cities and, and the county. So they kind of get money for whatever they want to use it for, you know, whether it's street improvements, uh, active transportation, uh, their own transit service that they want to put out, their own service, they can use that money for that. And then we have another, um, what we call a, a 20% pot. So 20% of uh, r and uh, is dedicated to what we call kind of the tier one operators and the tier one operators. I, I don't know how they decided who was the tier one versus two or three. Um, but the tier ones are the lucky ones. They're the bigger municipal operators, including Metro. So it's Metro. We're about 70% of that tier one. And then the other 17 municipal operators, which include like Foothill transit, Long Beach transit, Santa Monica, big blue bus, all of them, they represent about 30%. And, you, we all get our money off the top through formula. So again, it doesn't, you know, it, 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 it's not a board decision on an annual basis as to uh, who gets what that way. So there's some re sub-regional distribution already, even before you get into Metro's budget, right? And some of the areas, for example, you go down to, to Long Beach or the Gateway Cities area, most of their transit is provided by these municipal operators. So so Metro has a very small footprint in those areas. So they maintain, you know, very localized control over their service because they're controlling, you know, Montebello bus and Long Beach transit and so forth. Um, but within the, the city of LA, that's really where we have a lot of our service, right? Uh, so we work very closely with the city of LA and, and LA DOT. And, you know, when we go through our, our, our service changes, again, we try to keep the hours within the five service councils. So if we're cutting in one service council, we'll probably add back in that council area. This is really the first time that we haven't really tried um, to focus on that as much, even though we do make sure that there's some parity. We, try, we tried not to focus on it just because we needed to re-baseline our network. But going forward from here on out, probably for the next, until the next time we do it next gen, uh, you know, bus network redesign, we'll probably try to keep the hours within each of the service council areas. Was the funding measure passed with all that together? Um, no, the funding measure has, we have um, actually state legislation that determines the formula allocation program. That's the, that's the program that we, the, the, the calculation we use to distribute the 20% bus money out. Um, the local sale, the local money that goes to jurisdictions that, yeah, that's part of the, uh, the, the tax bill. And so there, again, there's a formula that allocates that out. I think it's based on population and a bunch, a couple other criteria. Um, but then we also have, you know, big projects that are on the expenditure plan and those are voted in by the, by the public. So, you know, if we're building a rail line out in the San Gabriel Valley, it wasn't because Metro's board necessarily approved that. That was approved through the expenditure plan that's tied to the ballot measure. So there, there's a lot of controls in terms of how the money gets pushed out. And, and in fact, when you look at our budget, it's, you know, even pre-COVID, it was like $7.8 billion, but a lot of it is already kind of accounted for or sliced up. And, and our Metro board really doesn't have any say in, in a majority of that budget, you know, because it's, it's either, you know, a, a, you know, basically tied to a project in the expenditure plan or it's getting pushed out through a, a formula uh, program. 
you know, so it, it's it, a lot of it's a lot of it's sort of been safeguarded in, in that sense. Is there a standard way that the uh, service councils deal with the environmental justice issues, whether it be environmental quality or um, or uh, low uh, low income ridership or um, disabled ridership? Is there a are there specific monies dedicated to that and all follow the same rules? Uh, I'll start off, and then Dolores can tell you her um, experiences with the different service councils and how they treat uh, environmental justice and so forth. Um, I, in terms of the, the quantitative analysis, uh, since we do that centrally uh, within my group for all five service council areas, it's it's using the same methods, the same strategies, and, and the same metrics and so forth. Um, the outreach, generally speaking, we follow the same ways uh, to do that, but we may customize it based on what the service councils want to do. Because if, if there's some major project going on, you know, the Crenshaw LAX uh, light rail extension, for example, was one of the projects that we're currently working on. And to come up with the operating plan, um, you know, the South Bay Service Council really had a vested interest in how we outreach to what community groups and so forth. So, um, you know, if they came out and they said, well, yeah, I understand your normal way of doing outreach and, and, um, and uh, engagement, especially with uh, uh, vulnerable communities and equity focus areas, but I also want you to do this, or I also want you to, to meet with those people. But Dolores can tell you a little bit more uh, details in terms of, you know, the differences in the in the different areas. Yeah, um, just to kind of echo what, what Conan said, you know, the councils will often, Dolores. you know, they're, they're community. Yeah. Oh, yes. Hi, hi, this is Doug. I'm, I'm going to ask Conan, can you can you mute when, when you're not speaking? I think, oh, sure. yeah, your microphone is popping off and on. There you go. I think that's where we're getting the feedback. Okay. Sorry, Dolores, go ahead. Okay. Um, so as Conan was saying, um, it really depends on the region. I mean, there are some very standard things that we do. Um, we take our census data and our customer survey data to look at the languages that are, or the second, second and third languages that are, prim are like the primary language other than English in particular regions. So we just went through our public hearing process and in some regions, well, we had Spanish for all regions as a second language. Um, and then for two of the regions, we also offered Mandarin and another region we offered Russian. Um, so we look, we look at that and it, and it varies from project to project, not just for the service councils, but any metro project. Um, right now we're building the regional connector in uh, Little Tokyo. We've got, I think three, they've got Korean, Chinese and Japanese uh, for all of their materials for that. Uh, in terms of fare structure and uh, dis services, I believe you said, um, those are programs separate to Metro. They would come to, um, they might, you know, those programs might come and make a presentation there and the council would offer their uh, their input. But, you know, the, the meetings themselves, uh, prior to COVID at least, were all held in public locations that were all ADA accessible, uh, to define places that were very accessible by transit. Um, I don't know, is there anything else on, on that that I can answer or, or add to that? Well, just how you prior, how the areas prioritize service to those communities or, or um, are, do, 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 are there special programs designed for low income? riders yes and are they this uniform across or does each council come up with its own uh program no they're they're separate programs uh, uh within metro we have uh, a tap system and um there are discount programs for seniors disabled um and students and um but those are those are those are umbrella programs over all of the metro region. It's not something that we necessarily have any say in. So the um, service council. The council will help. And, you know, they, they do. And, and when there are updates to those programs, they'll come to the service councils. Um, we also have a, like, what's it called? Low income. 
Lo, yeah, the know, life, I can't remember. The There's an acronym program. for the LIFE program. Yeah. yeah, there's an acronym for the low income uh, fair subsidy. Uh, and they'll come and they'll present also at the service councils um, when they're doing like a, a marketing rebrand or they want to help people to enroll in the program. They'll approach the councils about, you know, where should we be placing our um, our, our machines to uh, reload your, your fair cards or what organizations can we go to to help you know spread the word about these programs and so you have to think about the, the membership themselves they're like city council a lot of times they're city council members or they're community activists a lot of them work for nonprofit organizations or or otherwise kind of engaged in transit advocacy um, so we ask them to use their contacts to help us do that and then to also help us, you know, with their insight on how we can better outreach to those communities. So they tailor the implementation of the program, but the, it's an umbrella program that's consistent across the entire, yeah. all five yes. service. Yes. Okay, thanks. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's our our equity uh, framework is really driven by it's project by project. So, you know, the equity framework is, is really more of a, it's an entire sort of planning process and outreach process, but it's also the quantitative analysis behind it. I don't know why my mic is doing that, but uh, hopefully you can still hear me and I'll turn myself off as quickly as I can. But, um, you know, so it's, it's really not driven by the region per se, it's driven by the project. So if the project happens to be in that region, that region's gonna have a lot to say, uh, you know, relative to how we, how we look at equity uh, within that project. Yeah, I was talking more about service, not necessarily capital projects, but also the service to those different areas. So I, I, I think I got it though. So thank you guys. So I actually, two questions. oh, go ahead. Yeah, so I had two questions really quick on the, the councils themselves. Can you remind me, how long have those been in existence? Since about 2003. Um, and then there was the chain. Yeah, then there was the change in 2011. I've been working with them for seven years. Um, and I think we have two remaining council members, original council members still okay. <laughs> out of, you know, well, there's a total of 45 at any given time, but we've got two left, two left of the original members. <laughs> and I was just thinking through, so as you think about, um, kind of the onboarding of new members and getting new perspectives into it, what, what has that looked like for you all and how do you ensure that community advocates are having a seat yeah. at those tables? So, you know, I honestly, I don't necessarily have any say in that. My, my role is to notify the nominating authorities and that's changed, you know, as our board of supervisors changes, um, the, you know, or as the mayor changed and, and it really depends on each sort of administration, the current mayor, has an incredibly uh, detailed vetting process for all of their candidates. Um, they, and they give me some of the best candidates I've ever had on my service councils, to be honest. They give me great service council members. Um, but, you know, I also, to some extent, I can, ex I can, you know, establish a relationship with the nominating agencies, like the supervisors, deputies, or whatever, to talk to them, give them feedback about, well, this service council member is, their attendance isn't great or, you know, we really are looking for, you know, we just had two women leave. It'd be great if we could get another woman on the council. Um, and, and I do share with them the demographics of uh, the, both the council region uh, of LA County and of what's representative on the, count, on the council at a particular time that we're looking for nominees. So we, we do ask them to consider that when they're making their appointments. I have a quick question that's kind of following up from that. And a lot of it actually has to be about what was the startup of this process look like? Was there, um, you know, uh, what was there a, a certain amount of money that was um, given for startup purposes? What was the level of engagement and participation um, when you guys first started rolling out the service councils? What, and then what were some of the, takeaways or lessons learned from, from those early transition periods? I don't think Conan or I were around the agency when they first started yeah. up. Uh, <laughs> oh no, Conan, have you heard yeah, anything from any? Some of the, 
Yeah, it's no, some I of the mean, people I in our agency that... used to be the general managers and stuff, but I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah, they're all gone now, though. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, like, at least from my department, the service planning and scheduling, um, they basically took the department and, and sort of broke it up into five areas plus a regional coordination section. So, you know, when, when, when the staff came back and, and centralized, they all knew each other uh, from, from working in the same department previously. So it wasn't like we, we, you know, we went out and hired additional, you know, schedulers or, or, or service planning managers or whatever. Um, I don't necessarily know if the general managers came from within. I, I seem to remember that the service council members were already at Metro. So they're either a kind of division manager or one was actually a uh, more of an administrative person, uh, Alex Clifford, who's now at um, uh, Santa Cruz Transit. Um, and then uh, there was a few other ones. I think one, Richard Hunt. He's been at Metro for, or he was at Metro for a long time before he retired. So I believe most of them, if not all of them, were already at Metro in some function, generally within operations. And they were sort of picked up and put into a general manager role. And uh, the staff sort of disbanded to create these mini, you know, uh, these mini sub area, uh, 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 you know, sector. So I don't, I don't believe there was a lot of cost to, to set them up. Um, their offices were usually at a division or somewhere near a division. Um, we, we probably did rent, have to rent real estate for them, you know, to be closer to their, their, uh, their service areas and, and whatnot. So, um, you know, there's probably some money spent, but it wasn't like starting up, a, you know, an entire new, um, you know, uh, transit agency or, or anything like that. And then I'm in sure. terms of now, um, I'm sorry. Oh, um, I was just going to say in terms of now, the only, I'm the only current full-time dedicated staff to the service councils. The community relations staff is funded by the communications department. They, they attend my council meetings, but, and they support in that, in that role, but they, it's a very small portion of their time. And the same goes for service planning. Each region has its assigned service planner who's, who's already a service planner in our department. Um, and they they attend the meetings, but again, it's a it's a small portion of it's not necessarily out of like a service council budget. Madam Chair, if, if could I ask a question real quick, this Doug? Um, well, for a, a comment, it, it's interesting how you guys got to where you currently are with these regional service councils, right? Because you started you know big on the operations side, and I guess at some point 2010 2011, it was determined that you know probably wasn't the most efficient way to operate a regional transit agency. But um, it appears, at least, um, based on your presentation, that you know they saw the value in these having these regional service councils as an opportunity to to share with the the the, the board, um, you know, thoughts and and you know what was going on in the regions, right? And it just seems like you know they while they removed the operation side of this, they saw the value in that planning and service consultation with with the regions and it's it, I think it's intriguing to us because of that but the question I have for you guys is um you know are there areas of the current process and structure you have that you you know if if you were king and queen for a day that you would like to change or um you know because you guys are obviously closer to the ground than this maybe Dolores knows she's she's really close to, to this uh process I have to think about that. We've been, it's been such a blur <laughs> this last, I think, two years with our next gen plan. Here and there, things will pop up. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we need to go back and revise the bylaws. The bylaws haven't been revised since like 2009 or something. Um, to go back a little bit to the question, the previous question about um, the change between the two when I first came onto the service councils, um, it was maybe two years after the, cons the like reconsolidation had happened. And some of the council members, um, you know, 
would kind of air their grievances to me that, you know, you know, we used to look at budget and we used to do all these things. And now you just want us to look at service changes. They felt a little disengaged, but I think we also had a different type of service council member. We had, we had a lot more like business people. We tend to get now that we're focusing much more on Metro programs and active transportation and all of these different things. We tend to get a lot more people who are much more avid transit riders and community activists. Um, and I think it's a good thing overall, especially for this, you know, restructuring process that we went through. Um, but in terms of learning, I'm trying to think. I know I've here and there I've had, you know, I I think I wanted to try to find a way to build in some mechanisms to make sure that they're one riding more often. Because I know I have some council members that don't own cars, and then I have other ones who have never stepped foot on a bus, even though they're required to ride. Um, so that's something I would love to see firmed up um, to make sure that there's some sort of requirement. Um, one of our councils makes it a requirement that their own members do line ride. This is pre-COVID. They used to have to do line ride reports at each meeting to ensure that their, their members were riding. Um, so I'm trying to think of what other things I might want to add to that. But I got to think, think, think a little more on that. I think on top of what Dolores mentioned, it, you know, there's, you know, we, we had turnover on the service councils, but we also have turnover on the board. And so if you look at our board uh, makeup today compared to, I don't know, five or six years ago or something, we probably have, you know, half of the members are new or if not more. And so, you know, there needs to be a constant kind of onboarding for the board members to understand the service councils because, you know, several of them are, are nominating bodies that nominate uh, service council members, and they may not be aware of what they're nominating for. You know, <laughs> they just know they need to, you know, put someone in this position. Um, and they, you know, initially they, a lot of the new ones didn't really understand the process of kind of this localized governance over service. You know, they thought, oh yeah, you know, the service councils help us vet things out, but then we have the ultimate say in terms of approvals for service changes and. The bylaws actually state that once they're approved through the service councils, that's done. And all I have to do is bring a receive and file report to the board to tell them, hey, this is what we're going to implement. You know, um, in reality, it never happens that way. You, you bring it to the board and the board, if they want to pull it off consent and enter a motion to change everything on it, they can do, which happened one time um, back in you know 2009 or something when we had to cut service. The service councils spent a lot of time listening to the public, taking all the, you know, the backlash for for service cuts, right, um, during the, the great or pre-Great Recession. And, um, and they made the hard decisions to approve these service cuts. And when it got to the board, the board basically, you know, decided to reverse it. And so there was there. I know that there was kind of this low morale from the service councils at that time that. You know, the board, even though they, they put us in this position, they didn't back us up. So you need to have strong support from the board all the way down or whoever's going to govern, you know, oversee on, on top of the service councils. Um, that needs to be, that needs to flow all the way through. Um, that's, that's sort of my two cents on it. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Bo. I see that Jackie put something, a question in the chat. Jackie, you want to go? Sorry, Julie. Thanks. No, I, I just I thought I heard back in 2003 that these these councils were initially formed because there was some uh, a perception that that different geographic areas weren't getting their fair share. And so they wanted more of a voice. Uh, is that a fair statement or did I misinterpret that? No, that's a fair statement. And, and that's the reason why the action the service sectors were, were developed because the service, service sectors, I think the way that the executive staff saw it is it's one step better than seceding another, you know, region to a, a, you know, a completely different entity, like what happened with the San Gabriel Valley. So this was, you know, I mean, you could call it a stopgap measure, you know, I would call it, you know, coming up with a compromise, you know, or something that maybe is better than that. Uh, you still have regional coordination. It's all kind of under one umbrella budget and, and policies and procedures, but you have more of this localized decision making on the service and where it goes. And, and that's where, you know, the 
the localized operations needed a localized governance to to oversee it well i think personally that's one of the things i find most intriguing and, and interesting and and what i think would be a value um to replicate in some ways uh you know this is me to the rest of the body right now i i like the idea of having these local entities that are appointed um and the other thing i think is interesting to note is that there are specific uh you know as the mayor of lone tree i i am required to serve on a number of boards just because i'm the mayor and it seems like these are all uh you're in the job not voted into it but you're in the job because of the other job you have or you're you have been appointed by uh an appointing body even up to the 14 member governance you know the higher level uh la metro governance and then the others they're all appointed nobody is elected is that fair Yeah, that's true. It's contribute. it's our five five county board of supervisors, and then the mayor has four seats, and then the rest of the region is divided into four quadrants, and each quadrant has a representative, uh, an elected, you know, a, a you know a, a mayor or city council member or something. So you're right. I mean, when you get to the service council um, level, these are people who who wanted to serve on a transit board you know it, it's not like like you said it's another part of your overall job it's you know that's their you know some of them it's really their passion i mean dolores can go over some of these people that that will bugger every day for data and you know ridership and blah 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 and, you know and and that's why they spend 15 hours deliberating over 100 uh you know proposals i probably couldn't get the board to deliberate for 15 hours on that um, but but they will do it because they care they ride the system they know people who ride the system or they're advocates or or they're they're localized officials that 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 are very close to their constituents and, and they want to they want to do a good job so I see that we have a, a, a chat going on we have folks who want to know a little bit more about your live program and updates on that and your work um, on um, reduced and free fares. Anything you could elaborate on that for us? Um, Dolores, I'm I looking know. for the link right now and I'm going to drop it in the chat. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah, the, right, the, life, the LIFE program started a couple of years ago. Um, I'm not an expert on it. I don't, Dolores probably knows more about it than I do. Um, and then that other one, the Free Fares Initiative, uh, that program or that study just started actually a few months ago. And so there was a presentation we had to our service council members. Maybe Dolores, if you can find that, you can email that to, to Doug and he can get out to the, the group in terms of, you know, the background and what the objectives are and stuff. Um, my understanding is that they're supposed to come up with their recommendations by the end of the calendar year. So um, you know, so if you can wait till then, if not, um, Doug has has the project manager uh, contact information. So I'm sure they'd be happy to get on, um, you know, a, a call with you to, to go over those, that project specifically. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question about outreach. Um, so I, I guess just trying to think of like the process of how this works. So. Um, how do the service councils get information from citizens before, um, outside of like public hearings? Do you actually have um, service council reps who like do their own outreach or well, what does that kind of outreach process look like? Uh, let's see. Um, I, Metro has a blog, The Source. Um, we publish a monthly article on there listing what our, when the, when the council meetings are, where they meet, what times you know, how you get involved. I have a dedicated service council's email that people can send questions to. Um, I maintain subscription lists so that people can receive the reminders for the meetings themselves. Um, now that we're in COVID, we're taking e-comments and phone comments. I also send reminders to all of our service councils and I, you know, as part of their role, we ask them, share with your networks and, you know, uh, attendance tends to be driven a lot by what the topic is. Um, we will have council meetings where we have virtually no members of the public. And then when we were going through this whole service redesign, we were having 100 people show up to our virtual meetings. 
So that's part of it. Um, we also, Metro also uses, uh, we've started, since COVID, we've started using Facebook events. And um, there are some regions of the county, particularly in the South Bay, where I had gone to workshops and members of the public would say, you need to use Nextdoor. So we also use Nextdoor. Um, and then I also maintain uh, those, pu those public mailing lists are made up of people who have requested to be signed up and also people who've previously gone to service council meetings and signed in and asked, you know, and provided an email address. And then, of course, whenever there are larger efforts like our budget outreach, you know, the budget, they do an annual sort of a public tour and they go to each of the service council meetings and that's the public's opportunity to engage. They'll include the information, you know, we're going to be sharing the budget at the service council meeting. So we try to kind of piggyback off of any other outreach efforts that are, are being done that uh, through the service council. Great. Um, so, Kathy? Asked a question, brief description of unions, presuming you have them. Uh, sorry, what was the question? So, do you, does, your, um, do, does your organization have unions? How, is, how does it work? Can you describe a little bit about how you work with unions, if you have yeah. them? Yeah, we have five unions uh, that represent employees at the agency. We have SMART uh, that's over our operators, as well as, like, my schedule makers are actually SMART employees um, and schedule checkers. We have AFSME, which is our supervisors. Uh, we have Teamsters, largely the security force. Uh, TCU, which are a lot of the clerks. Uh, uh, the phone center, for example, are, are also TCU employees. And then we have ATU, which are our maintenance employees. So, um, you know, I'll I'll interact with them largely smart. Uh, I do have some TCU employees, but most of the time it's with smart uh, for, you know, schedules and operations, uh, making sure I have enough layover for people, you know, like all, all the normal stuff that you hear. Um, uh, but as far as the service councils, they they aren't really involved in in the service council process or, or any of that. Um, I have a question from Bob. Do you think your service levels would be vastly different if you didn't have service councils? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, you know, I, I don't think so necessarily. Um, again, as I mentioned through this next gen project, we did re restructure and kind of reallocate from one area to another. And it was, it was probably a, a rebaselining that, that needed to happen at some point, right? Um, but even so, it wasn't like we cut all the service out of, you know, one sector or one uh, service council area and moved it all into another one. Um, you know, we do keep in mind, um, you know, coverage and making sure that we have, you know, a certain amount of service within throughout the region. Um, sometimes what we do is we actually, if we have contracted service, um, I know, I know RTD has a lot more than we do. Um, we can we can actually transfer that contracted service to the local operators. So, for example, this time through NextGen, we actually transferred some service to Long Beach Transit, and we'll be transferring some service to uh, uh, Torrance Transit and Pasadena Transit as well. And the reason why we do that is that the service is probably more akin to their localized travel. It probably belongs better in their their sort of more localized network and so we're willing to transfer that service out and then that gives that local jurisdiction full control over over that service and and you know that the hours and and the assets and so forth so um we've done that sometimes when we feel like it makes uh, sense but you know we don't we don't make a big you know you know we don't try to we don't try to give up the farm you know all the time um you know uh but with 17 18 major operators in the region you have to have an eye on regional travel, regional travel needs, as well as localized travel needs. And, and as a regional kind of funding uh, a partner as well, you know, we need to make sure that we're distributing resources equally, equitably, and not just transit again, because we're different, we're different, uh, we have different modes. So, you know, some areas may, may want to have, you know, better you know their their highway projects improved or whatever uh, versus versus transit and that's just 
that's what they need from the, for their areas. All right, we're at the hour. Is there any final questions from the committee? Maybe one more that we want to try and get to? All right, I'm not seeing any takers. So one question I have, Doug, is there any way that we could get the slide for reference for the committee members? That would be great. Yes. Um, and then um, finally, Conan and uh, Dolores, thank you so much for your time and, and willing to, to chat with us and, and share your perspective. Um, you know, we, we really appreciate, uh, you know, you coming and, and, and sharing all of that because we have so many questions that we've been talking about and we've been really looking forward to this presentation from you guys and getting the chance to meet you. So um, thank you all. Um, at this point, we are at time. So I'm going to wish you all the rest of a happy Monday. Um, and then we're going to get together in, um, at our next meeting. So we'll see you guys all in, in a couple of weeks. See ya. Thank you. Thanks, Conan. Thanks, Dolores. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.